June 30. 1941, the summer heat reigned over the vast plains of eastern Poland, and only the motion of the train swaying slightly beneath us made the heat easier to bear. The heavily laden train was moving slowly through the randomly scattered pine forests and steppes. The land here was sandy and uncultivated. We travelled eastward past small farms and villages crossing winding rivers. The local population paid no attention to us. Only children waved at us from time to time from the dusty streets and the roadside. The men and women we watched from a great distance disappeared into the shimmering heat as the wheels of the train left them far behind. We spent our hours sitting or lying under a cloudless sky, perched on open freight platforms, between the guns and machines firmly attached to them. Contrary to the peacetime regulations to which our lives had previously been subjected, we were allowed to unbutton the top button of our grey-green uniforms and roll up our sleeves so that we might feel a little relief from the scorching heat. The first news of war with Russia had reached us a few days ago, and we had little talk of our possible participation in the battles. Everyone was confident that the war with the Soviet Union, like the armed conflicts with France and Poland, would end quickly. At sunset appeared the walls and towers of Krakow, the sacred city of Poland where Pilsudski's heart rested in the cathedral. The echelons, squealing with brakes, slowly rolled up to a peninsula near a dusty junction station. We were allowed to get out of the carriages. In a few seconds we were surrounded by a gang of unkempt children who were ignored by the military police sentries standing stony-faced nearby. A. Sibidio and Bro. Her, the children cried pitifully, greedily grabbing with dirty hands the pieces of bread which we took out of our bags and gave to them. Poor Poland, I thought as I gave a piece of bread to a business-like little girl in exchange for a tattered newspaper. The paper had been published the day before in German and Polish, and from it I could get the first news of the operation in the ease. Lemberg was being attacked. Gridnov, Brestlitovsk, Vilna, Kovno, and Dunneberg were fast falling into German hands. Catchy headlines stated that over 2582 Soviet planes and 1297 Soviet tanks were destroyed. Soviet-occupied Poland was liberating itself from the yoke of the Bolsheviks. Soon military policemen began to whistle and shout, gesturing for us to take our seats on the train. We piled onto the platforms. The wheels of the cars squeaked protestingly, and we moved slowly forward. I read the newspaper aloud to the soldiers of our gun crew, who were sprawled out on the flat platform. I tore my eyes away from the paper and looked back at the platform, where only a group of kids now remained. We continued to move towards an unknown fate. On July 1, we arrived at a station 10 kilometers west of Pelkini near Yaroslav. Here we unloaded and again moved eastward in a long column on foot. Some distance ahead of us, a chenillette, a tracked vehicle taken as a trophy during the French campaign, was dragging our anti-tank gun. Suddenly the smell of smoke and ashes that lingered here hit our noses, and soon we were looking at large craters and burned equipment the work of German Stuka dive bombers. Eventually our column came to a temporary feeding station where, under the watchful eye of the omnipresent military police, Red Cross sisters, mops, were sipping cold coffee from a horse-drawn field kitchen and pouring it into our mugs with a ladle. They tried in vain to elicit from us the latest news from home. Our long grey column moved on, leaving the Red Cross sisters behind, and began to march eastward. As dusk caught up with us, we sheltered our equipment and guns under the trees of a sparse roadside forest belt. We were ordered to provide anti-aircraft camouflage, and we tried to camouflage our positions with thin branches. At dawn, we were overtaken by supply units moving along the highway toward a distant sunrise. All the next day, we followed the intendant unit, and in the afternoon, we saw the enemy for the first time. On the dusty road towards us moved endless columns of Russian prisoners, dressed in shabby uniforms of protective brown colour. Many of those who were not wearing caps had bundles of straw tied to their short cropped heads to protect them from the scorching sun. Some were barefoot or half undressed. The strange heterogeneity of their clothing made them seem unlike soldiers. 
Their appearance embodied the features of white-faced Russians, dark-skinned Caucasians, Kai guys, Uzbeks, nomads with mongoloid facial features, many peoples from the two continents that made up Soviet Russia. They walked past us in silence, eyes downcast. From time to time we could see some of them supporting the wounded, the sick, or those who seemed exhausted. At school we had been taught that Europe was separated from Asia by the Ural Mountains. Yet here, as we thought in the centre of Europe, we saw Asia. The long column of wretches disappeared from view behind us, and as dusk caught up with us, we settled down to rest. Under a star-studded sky, we wrapped ourselves in camouflage cloak tents, and slept until morning. The 14th Anti-Tank Company was assigned the role of the advance party, and we moved out at 5-0 sharp. The settling ruins of burned houses were silent witnesses to the fighting that had taken place in the town of Jaroslaw during the Polish campaign, which seemed a long time ago, although only two years had passed since then. When we crossed the San River at Radimo, the Russian soil was already under our feet. We passed a large German cemetery left over from the First World War. Above its gate hung a faded wooden plaque, in memory of comrades fallen in Dubrovica. Our convoy was not allowed to stop long enough to inspect the graves. We had a vague idea of how many of our own graves would remain beside the roads deep in Russia. Soon on our way we came across fresh grave sites with rough birch crosses topped with steel helmets of the German Wehrmacht, which could not be confused with anything else. These graves, the first silent witnesses to the bloodshed near the road leading east, were arranged in orderly rows and columns. We tried to look away, but the graves kept attracting our gaze. We kept moving, and the silent red-brown mounds seemed to call. It was as if they were saying, don't leave us here. Don't leave us in this strange place. From the direction of Lemberg came vaguely the sounds of cannonade. The roads were getting worse and worse, and dust settled heavily on the soldiers, horses and vehicles. When the orange orb of the sun was at its zenith, barely breaking through the clouds of suffocating dust, only the vague outlines of a vehicle ahead of our platoon were visible. Sweat and dust mingling gave a very strange look to the faces under the green helmets. Near Krakowitz we again spent the night under awnings made of raincoat tents. Our trek to nowhere continued. We were moving forward to a destination unknown to us. Along the way we encountered squalid villages along the road. Russian women and children stared at us from doorways, gazing at us from behind window panes of poor quality. The only men to be found were elderly veterans of bygone wars. The villagers, when we questioned them, told us about the Bolsheviks. There was a look of horror in their eyes, a fear of the Siberian camps. They told us that there were portraits of Stalin hanging in the schools. When village teachers asked, who do you thank for your daily bread? The pupils had to answer Stalin. We were reassured by the first-hand knowledge of the consequences of communism. What we heard could not be considered merely the machinations of our own propaganda, Neidermeyer remark. Now that we have seen Russia, we realize what a blessing it is to be German. On July 5 we passed Lemberg. Since the beginning of the war the city had been hit twice and early in the morning the outlines of burned factories, houses lying in ruins, and shot down tanks emerged from the fog. Fat black smoke billowed from their still hot hulks. In one of the few sections of the city that had partially survived, people lined up in a long line outside a food warehouse. As we passed by, they stared at us indifferently. The military airfield of the Russians near Lemberg things led to an unusable condition. Blackened planes and shattered equipment could be seen everywhere and during a rest the soldiers wandered among the wreckage, photographed each other against the background of broken Soviet planes, curiously searched for and picked up broken parts, never forgetting for a moment the instructions that strictly forbade looting and unauthorized requisitioning of enemy equipment taken as trophies. The war with the Soviet Union had only been going on for a few days, and we looked with interest at everything that was connected with the Soviet army. Our campaign continued throughout the first half of July. Day after day we met on our way a great number of Russian tanks that had been hit. 
Here and there along the roadsides were overturned tractors with field guns attached to them. In the fields one could see numerous artillery positions left by the Russians. They appeared unharmed. The quick attack of our troops had taken the defending Soviet soldiers by surprise. We were surprised at how well motorized the Soviet army was. Our artillery was represented mostly by horse-drawn guns, as in the days of the First World War. The graves of German and Russian soldiers were now close together. The German graves, marked by crude wooden crosses, were on the right side of the road and the Russian graves were on the left. The Russian graves remained unmarked. The graves were marked only by rifles and bayonets stuck into the loose earth. German graves were topped with distinctive steel helmets and on some crosses personal insignia hung on linen twine in the hope of being picked up and registered. On July 8, as we approached Brody, we overtook the Intendant and Communications Units of the 71st Division of the 6th Army on a wide road riddled with deep ruts. The liaison men told us that the division had lost 600 men killed and wounded in the capture of Lemberg, and confidently declared that the war should be over in a few weeks. Our advance halted on the old frontier between Russia and Galicia. We expected to meet fierce enemy resistance when the 6th and 17th armies reached the Stalin line, which was a series of bunkers and well-fortified strongholds. We were disappointed when we learned that the 132nd Infantry Division had been ordered to remain in reserve. Most of us wanted to be on the front lines before the inevitable surrender of the Soviet Union. On July 14, nothing remarkable happened. Our life was boring. We saw roads 100 meters wide, on which the transport was moving dust, mud, scorching heat, thunderstorms and endless fields, where only occasionally there were not dense clusters of trees, stretching to the horizon. Straw-roofed collective farm buildings were visible in the distance, and we oriented ourselves by them as by palm trees in the desert, in order to get to the simple wells. We were told that the Red Army, in retreat, often poisoned the water in the wells. The remains of horses that were caught along the way gave off a stench. This odor will always remind us of the Soviet paradise into which we went deeper and deeper. The advance slowed down when we passed Yampol. From time to time we were lucky enough to get some onions and carrots in the villages through which we passed. Less often a chicken or a couple of eggs served to supplement our monotonous hiking rations. We wistfully remembered the time we had spent in Carinthia and Zagreb before the attack on the Russians began. There we were given cold beer and plum wine. The infantry kept marching from dawn to dusk. Dusty, sweaty, sticky and under consistently harsh weather conditions, we pushed deeper and deeper into Soviet Russia. In an effort to lighten the load of our camping equipment, we requisitioned small carts pulled by hardy Russian horses contrary to instructions. A civilization drifted away from us, left behind. This practice became more and more entrenched. The few dwellings were squalid and probably infested with lice. So we spent our nights in tents, in haystacks, and most often on the bare ground, sleeping wrapped up in the all-purpose raincoats issued to each infantryman. The soldiers of those units where horse-drawn traction was used were awakened at dawn by the snorting of hungry and thirsty horses. We passed wooden school buildings, which were little more than roughly finished rooms decorated with distinctive red stars, with a red painted pulpit for Communist Party political meetings. Tattered, dusty portraits of Lenin and Stalin hung on the walls, where under the Tsarist regime they barely knew the alphabet. Stalin introduced compulsory education. We were surprised to learn that many of the school children spoke a little broken German, and from the propaganda materials that came into our hands, we learned that the children were given primarily a political education. On July 17, for the first time since the beginning of the offensive, we had mail delivered from home. Ten days later, the division entered the Ukraine and, after passing through Kazatin, began to move southeast toward Russian. The Ukrainian land was steaming with summer heat. On wide sandy and rough stone roads we came to a land of endless horizons. Wide endless steppes, fields and sunflower fields surrounded the roads we travelled eastward. Primitive wooden windmills dotted the horizon. 
For us, they served as a place to drink and rest during the longed for trek through this land, which left us with an unforgettable sense of freedom contrasted with a pervasive sense of emptiness. We took a rest stop in an abandoned grove of acacia trees that provided faint shade amidst an ocean of grass. The company had walked 60 kilometers in less than 24 hours. The abrasions on our feet ached, our heels were battered into bruises. Dusty, sweat-streaked faces, wind, and sunburned, looked out from under heavy helmets at our possessions. Hands, slippery with sweat, clutched the tools with which we were digging communication passages in the ground. The command to entrench was given. Stripped to the waist, we silently dug into the ground, while the buzzing of bees nearby reminded us of their hard, endless labor. Clemens and Gare, the tractor drivers, decided to locate the hives and find honey. Armed with wokes, equipped with raincoats and gas masks that served as protection from bee stings, they disappeared from view, heading toward the collective farm behind the gun firing position. After working for an hour, I built an earthen fortification of the established pattern to the left of the anti-tank gun firing position. Its high wall, on which we were to place our rifles and grenades, faced toward the front. The anti-tank gun, perfectly camouflaged with the help of branches and grass, stood at the edge of the grove. On the horizon we could see a sandy road through the rugged terrain that lay before us, leading west and east, and in the shimmering heat of the midday sun we could see the outlines of the huts of a distant village. To the left of the road, on the edge of the position Sergeant Pell had placed his half-tracked vehicle, hiding it behind a grove of acacia trees, and proceeded to camouflage his atolt. The adjusters of the artillery and mortar units moved forward to their observation posts. Wheels of communications cable were strapped to their backs. Only occasionally the clanking of tools, flasks and cauldrons broke the tranquility of the seemingly peaceful situation. Holding my dusty tunic and putting it under my head like a pillow, I was just beginning to doze off in the midday sun when the silence was broken by a rifle shot. In one motion I rolled into a freshly dug single trench, slipped on my heavy steel helmet and put my carbine to my shoulder, tearing ahead. I saw no one, only the gently rippling grass. In our defence training we had been taught that we should shoot at anything that moved, at every leaf or blade of grass that moved. My heart was pounding, and my mind was filled with anxious thoughts. Would I have to kill another man today? Who will shoot first? Who will hit his target first? Me or him? Would I have to kill someone today to save my life and the lives of my comrades? I remembered the rows of graves with neat crosses on which hung personal identification marks and tried to put these visions out of my mind. To the left of our position, at a distance of about 600 meters, the silence was broken by the sounds of rifle fire. At first these sounds were like the familiar pops of carbines at the firing range, but soon bullets fired past the target began to whistle in the air and ricochet above us. With burning eyes we continued to look ahead, but we saw nothing unusual in front of our positions. Against the background of rifle fire in the distance, the rumble of an anti-tank gun was clearly audible. In a few minutes the incident was over. The dust and sourish odour of burnt cardite slowly dissipated into the air, and to our left an ugly black cloud rose into the blue midday sky. We remained under the protection of the fortifications and nestled against them. Our hearts were pounding with excitement. In muffled voices we tried to find out what had happened. After a while we learned through a messenger that Pell's anti-tanked gun had hit a Soviet armoured reconnaissance vehicle, and that an attack by a Russian rifle company had been repulsed. We did not realize that months and years later, which we were to endure, this short battle would be seen as just a random and insignificant skirmish with the enemy. That first battle in which the regiment took part bore little resemblance to the gruesome battles in the years that followed, which involved loss, grief and countless casualties. Many of us would never return from that land of vast expanses, but such thoughts did not occur to anyone at the time. I turned to my diary a small pocket-sized book. Its corners frayed and its pages stained with sweat and rain and recorded the incident. The two drivers returned with wokes from which honey dripped. 
the honey served as a great addition to our evening rations. We ate it with Russian bread, happy to have a change from our usual ration of canned liver and blood sausage. We drank cold tea with bread and honey and began to prepare for a new crossing, which was to begin at dawn. July 30 found us at the bivouac near Mikhailovka. For the past few days, squadrons of Soviet bombers and attack aircraft had been raiding individual units. As it turned out, they could not slow our offensive. Infantry companies and horse-drawn units moved all night and covered 65 kilometers, reaching Kargalik on July 31. A night password was introduced. Rumors were circulating that a long offensive on a broad front would begin at 7-0 the next morning. We spent the summer night wrapped up in cloak tents. We sat hunched in our solitary trenches camouflaged with grass. The rumors were confirmed, and on August 1, at precisely 7-0, we began a vigorous assault on the Soviet defensive fortifications near Mirovka. Before us lay a huge open space. In our field of vision stretched the steppe, where there was almost no possibility of hiding, except on the sloping ground with small hollows, invisible to the inexperienced eye. This gave a considerable advantage to the Russians, for being on the defensive, they were able to entrench securely, and in front of their fortifications lay a space freely shot through. We were finishing the last preparations for leaving our position and starting across the open steppe. Almost without difficulty, we dragged the ATPT to a position on the edge of a wheat field, which afforded a wide sector of fire. The shelling was eastward across a rippling sea of green, with occasional islands of abandoned potato fields. The first rays of sunlight danced on the ears of Ukrainian wheat, and through the morning haze we could make out the outlines of two distant villages on the horizon. We sat down on the carriage and sipped warm coffee, trying to drown out the feeling of chill in us. Everyone tried to appear carefree and talked about things unrelated to the war. Behind these conversations we tried to hide our excitement, which was clearly readable on our sunburned faces. The company officers huddled in a small group a few dozen meters away from us. They were quietly talking and looking at the enemy positions, from time to time putting field binoculars to their eyes. At 6.50, our artillery opened fire. Heavy shells buzzed above us, heading for targets in the enemy positions, and the infantry carrying weapons, ammunition, communications equipment, explosives, began to advance on a wide front. It seemed that all movements down to the smallest detail are subject to some clear plan. Therefore, at first, it seemed as if it was nothing more than another exercise in Plakirchen or Dugo Slello. A trophy French transporter rumbled up to our position. Taking our gun in the front, we climbed onto the transporter and drove forward, leaving a cloud of kicking up dust behind us. We passed the armoured reconnaissance vehicle that Pelly had hit the day before. Our eyes were fixed on the gruesome and still unfamiliar sight of a half-burned corpse with its bare torso hanging from the hatch. The two platoon anti-tank guns swayed forward over the hilly terrain following the units advancing towards Kargalik along the sandy road. The machine guns of the advanced infantry units were already in action. Lines of MG-34s could clearly be heard over the ears of wheat. Behind monotonously boomed mortars and artillery and small arms fire, on the contrary sounded shrill. Suddenly bullets ricocheted around us, and we rushed into the road ruts, looking for cover. No. Take cover. The artillery Captain Harton commanded. As the guns of all calibers rumbled, we could see him gesticulating with outstretched arms and his lips moving. His commands were drowned in the rumbling of the guns. The moment had come at last. Now it was our turn to face the enemy. Despite our fear, we met the inevitable with great relief. It was an indication of how our priorities had changed since the beginning of the campaign. The gun crews went to work automatically, just as they had done so many times before on exercises. Numbers 1 and 2 uncovered the gun, locked the wheels. Numbers 3 and 4 moved the gun fronts farther apart, and the gunner, meanwhile, set and adjusted the sight, lowering the barrel and bringing it to a horizontal position. The loader opened the breech block from the breech, and the numbers of the crew removed the ammunition boxes from the wagon. In one movement, the first shell entered the open breech with a clang, precisely fell into place, 
and the breach was closed. The gun was ready to fire. Hartman knelt beside the gun and looked through binoculars. He was directing the gunner's actions as if from a text beat. Right side of the hedge, scope 400, machine gun nest. Fire. He skillfully gave commands, and in response to them from the barrel one after another, with an interval of a few seconds, shells flew out. We could see how the infantry platoon of the 5th Company was forced to lie down in a shallow depression under heavy enemy machine gun fire. With 80 fire support, our shells were now bursting directly into the enemy positions. The platoon slowly advanced. We could clearly see the infantrymen, heavily loaded with equipment, slowly advancing across the wheat field. Thin streams of smoke showed where the dry grass had been ignited by tracer bullets. A second at GM from a distance of about 600 metres was firing on the collective farm at Clean Kargalike, which was reported to be occupied by Soviet artillery observers. The atched-roofed Kolkhoz huts caught fire. Thick black smoke billowed from them into the clear sky. We received orders to change our deployment and moved forward to the crossroads, in the same direction where we could see the burning houses. Through the bursts of falling mortar shells, and the crackle of machine guns, we felt joyous exclamations burst from our parched throats at the sight of the Russians leaving their positions. When they tried to flee from the collective farm, our machine gunners increased their fire, and again the rapid-firing MG-34 sent streams of copper-clad bullets into the clusters of fleeing figures of protective brown colour. To our right the first prisoners appeared with their arms raised and eyes wide open with fear. Their helmets and battle gear were quickly removed, and they instinctively, clasping their hands behind their heads, hurried away toward our rear. As our tracked machine was changing position, one of the track links flew off. Shinilet, describing a semicircle, very badly timed froze, helplessly stuck in the open in full view of the enemy. The driver and his assistant jumped out of the vehicle and began to make desperate attempts to make repairs while we unhooked the gun and got into the towing straps to drag it forward. The one at, which was assigned to our company, left us behind it, and bouncing on the bumps in the road, moved forward in the direction of the sounds of firing. Sweat soaked through the grey-green uniforms and left streaks on faces covered with dust and soot, and the Ukrainian summer sun heated the heavy green helmets. Exhausted, panting and gasping for air with open mouths, we clung to the towing straps. The familiar crackle of rifle shots was heard, tearing out pieces of the crusty, dry surface of the road. From time to time bullets fired from a heavy machine gun, mounted on the eastern edge of Klein Kargalike, caused small mushrooms of dust to grow along the road. Under the cover of a forward-facing shield of armour, we once again leaned on the harness, trying to pull the gun. Our faces were distorted with tension and fear, Suddenly the shield rang sharply as a bullet struck it like a hammer. It was a frightening reminder that we were still under fire from the lone snipers. Hartman ran forward to scout for a firing position for the gun. He had a machine gun hanging around his neck, his right hand clutching a grenade. He ordered us to move off to the right, to the outskirts of a wheat field, coming off the road. In the ruts we noticed an indistinct pattern of freshly dug up earth in the form of a chessboard. Here the Russians blocked our path of advance with box-like mines. Thanks to Hartman's reconnaissance we didn't run into them. We halted for breath in the thin shadow of the gun steel shield. There was no tree, bush, or building that would give us even a modicum of protection from the scorching midday heat. Breathing heavily, I lay down on my hands and knees for a moment. The rest of us plopped down in the ditches along the road, trying in vain to find shade. Some just stretched out on the ground. Soon bullets fired from the Maxi machine gun were clicking nearby again. As I lay in the dirt, the pounding of my heart gradually slowed down. The bullets carrying death continued to click and howl above us. The Russians were firing and trying to hit our damaged tractor. It was now a hundred meters away from where we had brought the gun on us. Fountains of earth were flying up into the sky. The chenillette was covered with a thick cloud of grey smoke from shell bursts. Despite the barrage of small arms fire, bullets whistled through the air near the drivers. 
They managed to get out unharmed and fix the track. Dumping into the driver's seat, Clemens sharply engaged the clutch. The engine roared. The tractor tilted forward and slowly, hesitantly drove in our direction across the open terrain. The second gun, which was 100 meters to our left, opened fire, trying to disable the Maxim. It then moved forward. The transporter slowly crept along the left side of the road until it turned steeply and into a huge wheat field that stretched to the horizon. The machine gun continued to fire at the hauler, but the small caliber bullets did little damage to the armored plating of the hauler. With mixed feelings, we welcomed the arrival of our driver and the tractor. We had tried desperately to redeploy, and now the tractor could haul the heavy gun. However, we were well aware that the tractor would draw additional fire from the enemy positions. The thought of abandoning the gun and seeking shelter from the enemy's fire flashed through my mind, but just as quickly I discarded the idea and pulled harder on the harness. In a few seconds, which seemed like an eternity, the gun was hitched to the tractor. The engine roared in protest as the gun began to jerk behind us, bouncing on the rough road. The Russians had moved their artillery fire closer to their positions, and the heavy high explosive shells were now coming much closer to us, exploding in the position of the units that had advanced the most. The incoming shells shook the ground beneath our feet, and it was with great difficulty that we could hear the shouted commands through the sound of the explosions. The seventh company on our left engaged in heavy fighting. As we advanced, the Russians began to get out of their fortifications and flee across the wheat fields toward Kargalik, which was about 500 meters away. Our forward machine gun crews, standing waist deep in the grass, opened fire with MG-34s. The machine gun barrels rested on the machine gunner's shoulders to maintain a wide angle of fire. Russians who were mowed down by machine gun bursts fell to the ground and disappeared in the ears of wheat. As we advanced, we came under indiscriminate rifle fire from a group of Soviet soldiers who later surrendered, approaching us with their hands raised. On their faces we could read fear and fatigue. The task of the day, to capture the railroad embankment that ran near the village, was accomplished. For six hours of heavy fighting, we captured 12 square kilometers of territory, and I thought for a long time about how insignificant these 12 kilometers are. 12 kilometers of vast country, where before us from dawn to dusk stretched to the horizon uncultivated fields. I wonder how many more such 12 kilometer battles we will have to endure during our trek in the direction opposite the sunset. We came upon one of our dead, lying motionless in the dust on the road. His helmet was still firmly fixed on his head, and his unseeing eyes were fixed on the sky. The Russian prisoners were immediately found occupation in carrying away the wounded to the field dressings, accompanied by our lightly wounded men walking along the side of the road. The mournful column moved to where the IE battalion was stationed, toward our rear. Thus the regiment first engaged the enemy. We also suffered our first casualties and did not feel the joy of victory. The feeling of excitement was quickly replaced by an overwhelming despondency and a desire to leave the place. So far we have not yet experienced the true nature of a long war, in which all former family and cultural ties fade into the background. They are replaced forever by ties of unity with the comrades who are now at your side. Our gun crew was ordered to join the team on guard duty, and at sunset we set up near the battalion line of trenches parallel to the road. The echo of single mine bursts echoed over the wheat fields, and seemed to follow the sun as it slowly set in the west, away from Germany. Our thoughts followed the setting fiery ball, breaking through the light fog to the horizon. We thought about our homeland, the borders of which lay 1,500 kilometers behind us. At night the front did not fall asleep. The reconnaissance units of both belligerents were in constant motion. They were sneaking in the darkness to the enemy positions to determine their location. Again and again the darkness was broken by the fire of Russian Maxim, which was invariably echoed by the piercing sounds of our MG-34, and they were immediately joined by indiscriminate rifle fire. From time to time bursts of hand grenades and sharp sounds of machine gun fire were heard over the fields, 
and for long moments the fortifications were illuminated by glittering flares which flew up into the sky and, hissing, hovered over the line of trenches. In the early morning hours we were taken out of the sector and stationed two kilometres to the south to prepare for another attack. August 2 was notable for a change in the monotonous field rations. We boiled potatoes dug up in an unnamed Ukrainian village and chicken, which Private Fear had already plucked. With boiled chicken and potatoes we ate cucumbers, previously peeled from the skin, a few hundred metres away, on the outskirts of the village, on a small high ground stood the burned half-trekked vehicle of non-commissioned officer Aina. The day before, during the battle, it had driven right into a well-camouflaged minefield, where three men of the gun crew had found their deaths. Two of the soldiers of the gun crew died instantly. Aina had both legs blown off by the explosion of an anti-tank mine, and he died during the night at the forward casualty collection point. We could see their helmets arranged around a birch cross near a hit, half-tracked vehicle. Their graves added to the increasing number of our casualties. That was the price the German army was paying for the war in the Soviet Union. Not far from that hilly spot where their graves were, several dozen mines dug by our sappers lay in a row. The soldiers had long ago found a fitting nickname for these death-bearing little boxes, Kindersarges. A rumour spread among the infantrymen that the divisional priest Zatska risked his life to pull out in full view of the enemy several soldiers wounded the day before during the battle. We were always interested in how the wounded were treated, as we lived all the time with the realisation that at any moment we might also be among them. Many of the soldiers who had hitherto to not been too drawn to religion began to attend services. For us increasingly aware of the possibility of death, the presence of a priest became more significant. As our losses increased, the priest, who in the German army did not wear insignia, played an increasingly important role in our lives. The fact is that to a great many soldiers he addressed his last words of comfort and gave them one last word of encouragement before they died of mortal wounds. Each day of the offensive our communications became more and more stretched, and as the pace of the advance slowed to a turtle's pace, we continue to be subjected to ever-increasing indiscriminate artillery fire. Once a shell fragment tore off my gas mask and sapper shovel. My tunic was also tattered, but apart from a bruise on my shoulder, I was uninjured. The advanced Russian units continued to retreat, trying to burn the few huts made of clay and straw that lay in our way. The Russians always left behind them units of omnipresent snipers, who at the cost of their own lives gradually exacted a deadly toll from us. On August 3 we spent most of the night lying down in the middle of a field in which we were growing turnips. The reconnaissance team had ascertained to a certainty that there was no enemy in the hitherto untouched collective farm, which was about 500 metres away from us. In the early pre-dawn hour we entered a tiny village consisting of a few houses, the field kitchen sent to the front-line coffee and schmaltz brot krung our gun crew occupied one of the small huts with a thatched roof. We piled straw on the earthen floor and dozed for a few hours, satisfied that we were no longer lying in the dark in the middle of the turnips. The next day we continued to move eastward until reconnaissance units reported that we had reached the broad Dinitir River. In our minds the vast majority of the Soviet army no longer existed. As we approached the banks of the Dnieper, victory was almost certain. For weeks our daily life consisted of endless movement in marching order, interrupted only by isolated instances of resistance by small scattered detachments of Russians caught by surprise by our advanced units. The occasional dead soldiers and officers of the enemy attracted almost no attention, and the prisoners, who always rose from the ground and cautiously approached us with raised hands, became a common sight. More often than not, they were simply disarmed and sent on foot to the rear, often without convoy. There they were picked up by reserve units. The evening of August, five found us near the newly erected defensive fortifications, on the approach to Velika Pritsky. Heavy artillery was rumbling relentlessly and ominously. Our artillerymen were shelling the enemy over the horizon. All night we anxiously awaited our offensive which was to begin the next morning. The attack began at 5.50. Its target was the Dipir. 
Our artillery batteries fired smoke and high explosive shells at the dominant height, designated as Height 197, and from our positions we saw many enemy units fleeing through the clouds of smoke that enveloped the battlefield. Powers later claimed that many of the Soviet soldiers fled in panic for fear that we would rain poisonous gases on their fortifications. Indeed, it was reported that enemy soldiers were seen donning gas masks during the attack. In a few hours, the infantry took the height with minimal casualties. At 8.50, the enemy fought a fierce battle to buy time, retreating to height 160. There, the Russians continued to offer stubborn resistance, using carefully constructed fortifications. Interrogations of exhausted prisoners showed that massive artillery fire was an effective means of suppressing the will of the defenders. In the afternoon, our troops were raided by several squadrons of attack aircraft. They did not do much damage. On the morning of August 7, we worked burrowing into the ground, building defensive fortifications near a village called Balika, located about 100 meters from the Dnieper. From our positions, we could see the broad Dnieper. We tried to bury ourselves in the ground as quickly as possible, fearing raids by attacking aircraft and also to protect ourselves from Soviet river gunboats. A few hours later, heavy shells from ships maneuvering along the Dnieper began exploding on the slopes not far from us. The gun of the first platoon unsuccessfully attempted to shell one of the gunboats. Our positions along the river were soon covered by enemy mortar and artillery fire. In spite of our thorough preparations, we were forced to abandon our positions to avoid losses inflicted by the enemy, who were beyond our reach. In this section, we found ourselves face to face with an enemy who had superiority in heavy weapons, and our artillery units were forced to conserve ammunition because our communications were stretched. The depth of our penetration into the Soviet Union began to be detrimentally affected, and the ammunition savings were the first sign of the ammunition shortages we would face in subsequent battles, and the results would be disastrous. The distant rumble of heavy guns at a considerable distance from us rang in our ears and was immediately echoed by the thunder of bursting shells, echoing across the rugged terrain. The evening brought several more Raider raids flying low over our positions. We tried to drive them away with rifles and small-caliber machine guns, but to no avail. One evening I saw two food carriers from an artillery battery position behind us. They were walking along the bottom of the hill toward the front line. The soldier in front carried a cylindrical thermos canister on his back reinforced with straps. They moved cautiously across the rough terrain in the fading dusk, trudging with difficulty over uneven ground that had been battered by artillery shells made soft and covered with a layer of mud by the incessant thunderstorms. Suddenly we were once more forced to dive for cover by a rater, which suddenly began to descend above us from the height of a low-hanging ridge of clouds, and two approaching silhouettes had hardly reached the shelter behind the wall of one of the mud huts standing on the edge of the village. The plane, gaining altitude, fired a machine gun burst at the village and disappeared into the grey storm clouds as quickly as it had appeared. A few moments later, those two men reappeared in our field of vision. They were passing by our positions. They moved slowly across the marsh, one walking close behind the other, and cursing could be heard in the silence. The man walking behind hung his carbine on his shoulder and supported the walls of the Biden with both hands, trying to salvage the rest of the day's rations. The steel Biden had been neatly pierced by a bullet fired from the airplane's inboard machine gun. The bullet had gone through the walls of the Biden, and the hot contents had dripped down to the ground in two streams, bypassing shell craters in the evening twilight. They walked, looping, through the sinkhole and shell-shattered ground toward the soldiers waiting for them at the artillery positions. Still cursing and blathering about rats, and Ivanov, they slowly stumbling, waddled forward toward their final destination. Soup intended for the artillery battery had to be severely economized that night, but, however little it was, it was still preferred to the monotonous iron rations with which we were often compelled to content ourselves on the march, consisting of sausage and stale bread. On the evening of August 9, we were fed with pork roast, which was brought to the front line by messengers from the field kitchen, 
and the next morning we were again ordered to deploy in battle order and move forward. The enemy attempted to move armoured units through a sector held by a neighbouring division, and units of the 68th and our 132nd Infantry Division were ordered to reinforce that sector. The move was scheduled for Epsari. In preparation for the move, we were given coffee and schmaltzbrot. Although the air was saturated with the nauseating stench emitted by a dead horse lying on the edge of the road, we enjoyed eating for the first time since being fed a pork roast the previous evening. During a short rest, stop a squadron of Stukas flew over us, and we could see their links breaking up and the planes dive like birds of prey on unseen prey. The sirens of the airplanes sowed panic and confusion in the ranks of the enemy when the Stuka threw bombs at columns of Russian tanks and troop concentrations that were out of our field of vision, behind the terrain. Clouds of black smoke rose in the immovable air toward the sky, indicating the location of those tanks and vehicles that had fallen victim to the dive bombers. Soon the Russians retaliated with their own raids. Having no time to prepare trenches, we rushed into shallow hollows in the ground in search of cover. But the enemy planes simply passed us by. Behind our back a few bombs fell near the collection point for the wounded. There were no casualties. On August 12, our pilots dropped artillery ammunition in the location of our batteries in the rear. Artillery units had been firing continuously, repulsing the Russian forced attacks during the previous day, and air reconnaissance reported that the Russians were withdrawing their troops to the east, crossing the Dnieper near Kaniv. Our units continued to press on, attacking, but enemy resistance hardened and we captured a small air. My gun was positioned near a railroad embankment to protect the railroad tracks going towards Kenev across the Dnieper. All day long the front line in our sector was quiet, and I went with Hartman to reconnoiter our section. Behind the railroad track, moving in an easterly direction along the edge of a small grove, we suddenly found ourselves face to face with the muzzle of a machine gun Maxim, the distance to which was not even ten metres. Hidden by the shadow of low branches, the motionless figure of a man in a khaki coloured uniform, drenched in blood, hung down from the machine gun as if resting. Quietly taking the automatic rifles off the safeties, we cautiously approached, examining the picture unfolding before us. We found a group of dead Russian soldiers, about thirty men, lying in an uneven line close together along the railroad embankment, urging from the position of their bodies. During the battle of the day before, the platoon had been hit by a line of flanking fire, fired from a tank or airplane machine gun, which had killed or wounded everyone instantly. I slowly crept forward to examine one of the corpses, and saw that the lifeless hand of one killed man was still clutching an open individual bandage bag. The badly wounded Russian had tried in vain to dress the wound, but, unable to stop the bleeding, had slowly died where he now lay. His uniform, unbuttoned to the waist, was blackened with dried blood, which flowed from the fatal wound. I took my eyes off the man and held them on the body, which wore a uniform with the buttonholes of a sergeant. The sergeant was clutching one of the wheels of a Maxim in his hand. His unseeing eyes were fixed forward on the machine gun belt, on the place where it entered the machine gun's cartridge. Another clutched his rifle in cold fists. His head rested on the ground. It was as if he were asleep. His olive-coloured helmet was buckled under his chair. Hartman followed quietly behind me. He slowly approached two more Russians lying close together, side by side. One of them put his hand on the other in a last embrace, as if trying to cheer his dying comrade. As Hartman approached, a swarm of flies rose as if to protest and break the dead silence, and I drew forward to join Hartman in witnessing the horrifying sight, silently treading the ground where the carnage had taken place. Gartman suddenly turned and slid past me, heading back to where we had come from. Carefully avoiding the gaze of the slain, I quickly followed his example. In this abode of the dead, only the trees, motionless and silent, seemed to be surviving witnesses to the unseen battle that had taken place here in the clearing. Even though I had seen death with my own eyes many times in the past few months, I was still, without realising it, a newcomer to the real cruelty and horrors of war. 
I could not have imagined then that in the months and years to come I would become desensitized to death on the battlefield, and that such sightings would become commonplace for all of us. In the months to come, our reactions to someone's death that we encounter will become coarsened, and we will see death as something inevitable. We will search corpses for documents, pick up weapons and equipment so that we can use them ourselves. But at that early stage of our baptism of fire, we were still burdened by naive thoughts of compassion for the dead and disgust at physical contact with the bloodied and mangled bodies lying on the ground where they had fallen. On August 13 we occupied a field fortification, previously in Russian hands, about 10 kilometers northwest of the town of Kanev on the Dnieper. We got trenches dug in clay by the enemy, who had occupied these heights only a few days before, masters in the construction and camouflage of defensive positions in the open. The Russians had constructed earthen fortifications consisting of round cells about waist deep, the bottom of which was widened so that a man could lie down comfortably, and there was enough space to stretch his legs. The clay dried quickly, became firm, and was an excellent material for the construction of passages, so I boldly improved my trench with a sapper's spade. It must have been occupied by a Russian of rather small stature before our attack. The cool earth of my new dwelling seemed comfortable to me, despite the stifling heat of a sultry Ukrainian summer day. I felt safe here. I had the feeling that nothing could happen to me suddenly, without warning. We cautiously slid forward into the open to gather grass and straw, with which to camouflage our anti-tank gun. When evening twilight came, someone brought in a large armful of hay which was distributed among the gun crews. With this we could count on spending the night comfortably on the condition that we would not be awakened by Ivan. As twilight turned to darkness, the evening shadows disappeared. What remained were the ragged silhouettes of rugged hills and deep ravines, or gullies, to the east of us on the opposite bank of the Dinoper. In the battles that followed we were to study them well. The enemy had moved his defensive positions, locating them in a small forest about 300 meters from our position. A small valley began on the left, along which grew birch trees and dense small woods. This would have given the impression of peace and seclusion if there had not been lines of maxims disturbing our position from there. We left one man on guard duty, who ducked behind the sturdy armoured shield of the ATP to protect himself from the occasional machine gun bullets and snipers. The guard changed every hour, and we shortened the night in our hay-lined trench. A surprise attack is a basic property of war. A soldier may calm down for a while, in a rare moment of imaginary safety, settling down in a simple shelter in front of a warming fire on a cold night, or sleep soundly curled up in a trench, and immediately afterward he may be drawn into an unsparing mad scramble. Again our rest was disturbed by two supply carriers who emerged from the darkness and brought the unpleasant news that we were again to change our position and prepare for another morning attack feeling the now familiar chill deep in our stomachs. We left our cosy trenches shortly before midnight and were soon working under the starry sky, building new fortifications to the right before dawn. As we worked, the occasional muffled rattling of trench tools was clearly audible to the enemy, and all night long flares hissed from the edge of the nearby forest. Now and then we had to throw ourselves to the ground and lie motionless to protect ourselves from the fire of the Mac probing our positions. Bullets snapped in the air above us, and tracer bullets left behind them orange-red furrows arcs and ricocheted in the darkness. In the early morning hour we received reinforcements in the form of two self-propelled guns, which, rumbling, rolled up to our positions on heavy tracks. At first we worried that the sound of their Maybach engines would draw unwanted attention to our positions. Despite our fears, their presence did not draw additional machine gun fire on us, perhaps because the Russians did not want to reveal their location to the self-propelled guns. Our attack began at 3 p.m. On August 14, after ten minutes of mortar fire which was conducted through the forest, the forward units began to advance and we already 100 meters from the forest belt. At this time a Russian tank camouflaged on our left flank opened fire. It was spotted by one of our self-propelled guns, 
and after a brief firefight the Russian tank caught fire. Our machine guns and mortars opened fire on the forest belt, trying to cover the ubiquitous enemy snipers, and we together with them began to shoot from our at DM with fragmentation shells on the tops of trees. After hitting an enemy tank, we continued to attack rapidly. We had reached a wooded area, and despite our misgivings of the night before, it was now encouraging to have the support of heavy anti-tank assault guns. We were able to deduce the location of the tank that had been hit by a cloud of black smoke rising from the burning turret. Word reached us that one of the companies had suffered casualties from a heavy armoured vehicle before locating and destroying it. We had the last line of fortifications lying on our way to Kaniv. Although our objective for the attack had been achieved, we were again ordered to move forward after receiving reinforcements. Our attack resumed at 18.0. Our forward-mounted gun, bouncing on the road, was moving behind the tractor toward the town following the attacking company of infantry, when we were suddenly shelled from the flanks. The fire came from the direction of the enemy's field fortifications. The Russians, who had been lying in hiding and had let our forward units pass through, now bombarded the platoon with small arms fire. Bullets struck the thin plating of the tractor and whistled in the air above us. At that instant the engine of the chenillette stalled. The tractor tilted and stopped. With beating hearts we grabbed our automatic rifles and carbines and desperately rushed for cover. At the realization that we had been caught unawares in the shelled terrain, terror gripped us. Our machine gunner, Robert, with whom we had served together since the recruit course, picked up his MG-34, jumped to his feet and rushed forward, ducking under the weight of the machine gun. He quickly ran toward the flashes of gunfire that revealed the location of the enemy positions, firing machine gun bursts as he ran, holding it against his hip. Caught by surprise by his attack, several Russians crawled out of their trenches and stumbled toward us, raising their hands as a sign that they were surrendering. We caught another glimpse of Robert before he disappeared over the hill, firing machine gun bursts at the clusters of Russians who continued to resist. We quickly removed the HEM from the front and prepared the gun for battle. However, not knowing where Robert was, we were forced not to open fire. With machine guns and rifles at the ready, we moved forward to a small height, and on its crest we found Robert lying on his MG with a bullet through his heart. The bullet had gone through his heart and out through his back. A trickle of dark red blood flowed from the wound. Hartman knelt down beside the motionless figure. He confirmed that Robert was dead and gently rolled him over onto his back. Reaching for the linen twine from which each soldier's individual identification tag hung, Gartman snapped the metal tag in half along the seam, then unbuttoned Robert's tunic and took his soldier's book and watch. We stared into questioning eyes, staring to the pre-sunset sky. The question seemed to be written on his shocked face. Why, why do I have to die now? As we carried the body to our positions, dusk descended upon us. My thoughts were consumed with the impressions of the past weeks, and I imagined the graves left behind beside the roads. For the first time in my memory, as an adult, I cried at the loss of a very close friend. The next day the company commander wrote letters to the relatives of the five men who had fallen during our last battles with the Red Army. On August 17, shallow caves dug in the gully served us as shelter from stormtroopers' raids. We had reached the heights of the western bank of the Dnieper and were now under indiscriminate gunfire from positions camouflaged on the eastern bank of the river. To the southeast of us was the town of Kaniv, and a railroad bridge led across the river to the east. By capturing this railroad siding, we cut the Russians' last overland route of retreat. The Russians during the previous night had tried to drive their troops farther east, and during the early morning hour certain groups of enemy soldiers had tried to escape by boat. Small arms fire was occasionally heard throughout the night as the retreating Russians came under the fire of reconnaissance detachments. A great deal of military equipment and vehicles fell into our hands, including many American Ford trucks. We found two abandoned but completely undamaged 34 tanks hidden near a beam, ready for battle with full ammunition. We climbed into the tanks, trying in vain to find anything useful for ourselves. 
For several days I was tormented by severe diarrhea, and was soon rendered unfit for duty by a violent headache accompanied by dizziness and severe intestinal colic. I soon developed a fever, and with the help of several lightly wounded men I was carried to the infirmary. On our way there we walked through the field where the battle had been fought the day before, and the small hollows with bushes and birch trees growing around them, which we looked at with burning eyes, seemed calm, peaceful, with few signs of the heart-wrenching events that had taken place here, with the exception of some bomb craters and occasional shell fragments. There were few traces of the war that had traversed this land. We passed three birch crosses, decorated with tufts of greenery and wildflowers, located at the foot of an elongated hill. Beneath the surface of the freshly dug earth rested my good friend Robert, wrapped in a trench coat, lying beneath one rough birch cross along with his fallen comrades. His grey-green helmet was slipped over the cross to show his place among the dead. The grave soon faded from my consciousness as a painful throbbing increased in my head, somewhere behind my eyes. In feverish unconsciousness, we waddled back to our forward positions abandoned three days ago. The burned tank served as a good landmark for us. After walking about 100 metres more, we came upon a staggering figure with dangling arms and swaying torso. This ghost was obviously trying to walk in a straight line. Two of us took our carbines off our shoulders and got close enough to recognise the bloody Russian army uniform. He was wearing under a layer of dirt and dust. His beltless gymnaster was hanging loosely on him. I walked up to him and, taking him by the shoulder, looked into the lean, parchment-coloured face of a soldier who was about twenty-eight years old. He, in turn, looked at me with wide-open, unblinking eyes, the eyes of a madman, I decided. I determined from the dried blood on his neck and torso that he had suffered a severe head wound as the grey matter of his brain protruded from his short-cropped skull. A cloud of flies swarmed around the wound, which had black and red blood caked on it. It was clear that a bullet or shell fragment had blown off part of his skull a few days ago. He must have been lying unconscious in the shallow woods shortly before we arrived. Two of us took him by the shoulders and led him toward the infirmary, trying to support him while he staggered forward, unable to keep his balance. Through a slight fog in my head caused by pain, I realised that a horse-drawn artillery battery had halted near us for a rest, moving in a cloud of dust, and that several infantrymen had helped us to climb up to the charging boxes. They offered us water from field flasks, and a soldier in a khaki-coloured Russian uniform, wedged tightly between us, began to mutter something. Through his wheezing I could make out, water. Exhausted, we reached the infirmary, and through a veil of feverish confusion I watched the wounded with whom we had come, and the Russian soldier's head being bandaged. I was given some pills, and the military doctor told me that the thermometer showed a temperature of 39.8 degrees. I was poured hot tea into a camping cup, and the orderly took me to the former school building and laid me on a straw mattress. I slept exactly 18 hours, until the afternoon of the next day, and felt refreshed and invigorated. My lunch was brought to me, which consisted of a good portion of pea soup and stale black bread, which I devoured greedily. Looking around, I was surprised to see that the place was almost deserted. The wounded who had besieged the infirmary were no longer here. They had either been evacuated or deemed healthy enough to return to their units. Only a few sick soldiers remained in the infirmary, cared for by the young orderly, who had been assisting me when I arrived. He informed me that the badly wounded had been taken away early in the morning, and that the military doctor had tried in vain to wake me up. The next morning my fever broke and I was sent back to my company. After riding in several trucks and horse-drawn wagons, I succeeded in finding my gun crew, which in my absence was again being thrown into action against enemy units that had temporarily broken through near Kanev. On August 26, we used all the time at our disposal to reinforce our positions. Within the overextended sector assigned to our division, there were many areas where the enemy could land. Fortunately, our heavy artillery, in the event of an attack, was able to block them and provide us with fire support. 
On the night of August 28, we were moved to Kodorov on the Dnipir River to reinforce us with an artillery company occupying an important height on the front line. This height dominated the heights on both banks of the river. It was occupied by scattered small units. The village was located along country road where two gullies converged. The primitive dwellings standing apart from each other were scattered along the entire length of a small gully stretching to the river. Trees, unkempt fences, and village mud-brick houses with thatched roofs and whitewashed walls hindered our view of the river from the Ate position. A large, conspicuous stone building served as the main landmark. Before our unexpected and uninvited appearance, it had been the village school, under the steep, high bank less than 100 metres from our positions. The river lazily carried its waters to settlements unknown to us, and on the eastern edge of the village was a field planted with tomatoes. From the edge of the bank the expanse of the river was clearly visible, which in its course skirted a small group of islands. The eastern bank of the river was densely covered with an abundance of trees and bushes. The flat islet directly opposite us was covered with dense vegetation, and this well concealed all signs of Russian presence there. Our artillery support company, stationed on a dominant height, was entrenched near a collective farm where tomatoes were grown. From here we had a fine view of the territory held by the enemy. It was possible to calculate the places of accumulation of enemy troops, by jets of smoke that rose vertically, where numerous fires were burning and food was being cooked on them. Our artillery continued to work. It was continuously shelling, trying to disrupt the enemy's supply lines, which were out of our sight. Otherwise the front was quiet. Soon after our arrival we sat down in front of one of the huts, and I took out a harmonica from the inside pocket of my tunic. When I began to play folk songs, I was quickly surrounded by a motley crowd of locals, who appeared before us like shadows, coming out of neighbouring houses. The tune, unshaven and far from home, enlivened the crowd. They clapped and sang their folk song, Stenka Razin. Women and girls shook their heads to the beat of the tune, and old men and boys stomped their feet on Russian clay to the song played by a German harmonica. An hour later we received orders from the Patutun commander to spread straw in the structure of a former warehouse and canton ourselves there. Distressed that we would not be housed in houses standing in a row away from each other, we grudgingly complied. Many of us felt as if we were being trapped because the building had only one exit and was in the centre of the village. Therefore, from there the area could not be shot at in any direction. As a last resort we would have preferred to bivouac in the open, as we were used to. Our gun remained taken on the front and hitched to a tractor in a grove at a distance of 25-30 metres from us, and a sentry was posted near the only exit of the room who was ordered to be on the alert. After a cloudless day came a cool summer night. There were about 30 of us quartered in this improvised barracks, and we soon fell into a deep sleep. Just before dawn we awoke startled by the sudden explosions of hand grenades outside the building where we were stationed. An automatic rifle drummed on the back wooden wall of the warehouse building and through the door into the darkness of the building a guard skulked. There are Russians here, there are Russians here, he shouted. I slipped my feet into my boots, grabbed my gear and ammunition pouches, and rushed with Hartman and a few other men toward the only exit. Staying true to the discipline of the German Wehrmacht, our first thought was to get to the ATAT and stumbling in the darkness, we moved toward it. I caught a glimpse of sparkling sparks arcing toward us from the creek bank, and instinctively ducked under the tractor, and a second later the grenade exploded without harming me. Several of the men who had managed to concentrate near Gartman's gun, at the beginning of the surprise attack, now opened fire with rifles and machine guns, kneeling behind the tractor or lying flat on the ground. After I had removed two grenades from my belt and thrown them over the tractor in an arc toward the creek bank, Hartman threw another into the ravine. When we had suppressed the enemy fire, the crackling of the Russian machine guns subsided and no more hand grenades flew at us from the riverside. Meanwhile, several more soldiers of the platoon ran out of the building and tried to reach us towards the wooden bridge about 100 metres away. A new firefight broke out. 
Suddenly we saw the platoon commander, who rushed past us shouting I'm wounded, and quickly disappeared into the darkness by the warehouse. Taking advantage of the pause in the firing, we unhitched the HEM from the tractor and opened fire in the dense small woods along the river, where we could still see flashes of Russian gunfire. We could hear the bullets bouncing off the shield of our gun. With a few dozen fragmentation shells, we succeeded in suppressing the enemy's fire, and the Russians ceased further attacks. It all happened in less than ten minutes. Hartman and I hurried to the warehouse building, where the lieutenant lay with a through-bullet wound in his thigh. Blood was flowing profusely from the wound, which was already being dressed by a corpsman, although the corpsman said that the artery was intact and that he found no damage to the bone. We left the two liaisons and his driver with the lieutenant and returned to our platoon. Hartman took command of the platoon and ordered Burkhart and me to contact company headquarters in the village. We cautiously ascended the bridge and immediately noticed the lifeless body of a Russian lying a few meters away from us. Evidently, the enemy had ceased the attack and retreated. A few minutes later, we were on our way to the company headquarters located in a farm building. The headquarters was full of wounded men who were being assisted by a medical field officer. Here we were told that in the course of the attack, the target of which was our headquarters, the Russians had simultaneously attacked another unit stationed on the eastern edge of the village. We reported, and to our relief we were allowed to return to our platoon, to familiar surroundings. Returning from headquarters, we moved the ATP to a more advantageous position, which was located about 50 meters from the storage area. From this position we could cover the area from the edge of the ravine to the bridge with fire, and were capable of direct fire in case of another attack. We kept the ravine and its slopes to our left and right under close observation, but we did not notice any further enemy movement, and we were not shot at again. There were rumours that the Russian attack had been repulsed and that the lieutenant had received a high mate shot. We were just beginning to feel safe in our new position when suddenly in the light of the rising sun, I noticed a small detachment of Russians climbing up the slope toward the school building, dragging a machine gun behind them. We rushed to our positions and immediately opened fire on them with armor-piercing and high-explosive shells, as we had already used up our fragmentation shells. The Russians rushed for cover, leaving a few killed and wounded in the open. We shelled the place where they remained in cover, and also an abandoned school to prevent them from setting up a machine gun. After firing a few shots, we saw some of the Russians retreating quickly to the rear, accompanied by the frequent pounding of our MG-34. Suddenly, right in front of us, the air exploded with the fire of machine guns and rifles. From close range, we were fired upon by the infiltrating Russians, and the shouts of the Ivans were clearly audible from the ravine that served as our shelter. Through thick bushes, trees, and small fields where sunflowers, tomatoes, and bean plants grew, they approached our positions, throwing hand grenades which cleaved the air, rolled a few paces from our gun and exploded. We frantically snatched the last box of 37mm shells off the tractor, and the loaders raked and kicked the shell casings away in an attempt to clear the gun's firing position. We had only 30 armor-piercing shells left, and as I loaded the last clip of rifle ammunition into the magazine of my carbine, a quick survey of the others showed that they were also running low on ammunition. Hartman had only half a magazine of rifle cartridges left. The Russians tried to break through the road and reach the warehouse building. It was clear to each of us that we had to prevent them from reaching their objective at all costs, lest we be cut off from the rest of the company, which meant imminent destruction or capture. At about 10.0, the last anti-tank shell flew out of the smoking barrel of our ATT. In an attempt to prevent us from using the gun tractor, the Russians attacked the building directly and soon it was set on fire with either tracer bullets or a Molotov cocktail. We had no way of knowing whether our temporary barracks had been evacuated in time. We could only hope that the wounded officer had been taken to safety. When we had used up the last of our ammunition, I removed the bolt from the breech block and tossed it into a thicket of bushes and then joined Hartman. We crawled down the ravine leading in a westerly direction, 